And it becomes more by interacting with it. And I think that is so important. Like, is a guitar just a guitar? It is, it, it is really about the interaction. And if you can use AI as a sparing partner or a muse or whatever, something that throws ideas at you, you still have to create it. Yeah, but for the, like the um, concept of art, I mean, it's totally art for sure. But the artist is a human being because only like a human being um, which has like freedom is able to do art. And this is not like, it's not a fault of it because it's just inherent in the history of it, but it's something that needs to somehow be addressed at this point because otherwise we're gonna get stuck in a loop, like cultural wise, right? <laughs> Welcome again to the panel, AI, what's up with that? I hope that we can clarify it a little bit. Uh, Jovanka von Wilsdorf to my right, Dorothea Winter to my left, and I will moderate the session, keeping time and getting interactive with you guys, hopefully. Um, first of all, um, the usual introduction but I thought I would like to have something special. So could you maybe, in just a few sentences, explain a little bit about your background, where you came from, your ambitious education, professions, before you hit AI? And when AI was coming into your place first? All right, well, I am a musician for as long as I know, basically, with since I'm nine years old, I try to transform things I feel into music. Um, I toured Europe with my band. Uh, we released five records on Sony and Monica Enterprises. Um, yeah, then I became a songwriter and um, at BMG Rights Management means I'm writing songs with other people for other people, which is great because after five records, it's like if you, when you write songs for yourself, you're always going on your own holodeck. But if you write for someone else, you're actually allowed to step into the holodeck of someone else. Like an actress doesn't want to play herself all the time. She wants to play in a splatter movie, maybe, or romantic comedy, whatever. So this happens and then, long story short, I got signed to Universal with the idea to create a virtual pop star. That was 2014. And yes, we were a little bit too early. So long story short, um, the production got turned into a normal pop production and all good. It came out successful, but my heart was broken because I had looked through the eyes of this virtual creature. And then I started to research a lot, then this is how I discovered my nerd gene. And I found myself on panels at Mutech or South by Southwest uh, speaking on AI with data scientists and other okay. techies and stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are sorry to hey, actually. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. Great that you are here. <laughs> yeah, Whatever COVID you test. had to do, now you're here. COVID <laughs> test. Yeah. Yes. Of course. No problem. So, Welcome. Dorothea, what about you and your first contact with AI dropping on what kind of background you had? Okay, I'm living up to my philosopher's cliche. I didn't do much more than just philosophy, <laughs> but it's with full of my heart. <laughs> and um, yeah, I came to the AI party really late, just like two or three years ago. Um, from the ethical point of view and epistemological point of view in philosophy and aesthetics as well. And since then, I'm focusing my research on it, but I won't talk about AI now. <laughs> yes, okay. that's my introduction. <laughs> Thank you. So now about you. You are a sound designer. You created meta DJs, shaking up the whole cultural scene. Exactly. So, but my question is... Can you tell us a little bit about your background, where you come from before you hit AI, and when yeah. the first time, yeah, it came into your life? 
Yeah, sure. So my background is I'm an electronic musician. I'm from Tijuana, Mexico. I moved to Berlin about four years ago. And I've been always interested in uh, new technologies for electronic music production. So I come more for the music tech side. And uh, yeah, basically exploring new technologies to make new sounds for new styles of music that didn't exist before, right? So like this idea that every technological shift brings about new music. I come from this kind of idea, right? So uh, my first contact with machine learning was about like in practice to actually use it in my work uh, about three years ago when I started uh, self-teaching myself what is machine learning. Uh, I started off with like supervised machine learning with the open source community like Wekinator, these kinds of software, and then slowly uh, building a knowledge on deep learning. And uh, part of my research itself is about basically tearing apart the myths of AI, right? So tearing apart these uh, sci-fi narratives that, oh, it's going to take her, blah, 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 you know? What, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 we come to this back later for sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so at this point, I would like to ask the audience to, that we have kind of an impression where, where to steer our stuff to. Um, are you listening to AI music or are you aware of uh, AI co-created music just hands up yeah okay that's that's not bad and uh, if there are musicians creative ones have you ever been using AI tools on your own okay and then are there people who actually work on developing AI tools for creativity music for the usual suspects as native instruments, Ableton, Apple, blah, blah. Few, okay. Nice. So at least you know all the AI top 10 hits, that's great. So I think uh, our discussion will be fruitful for you. Um, so I'd like to go on with a catchphrase, which is, is AI more than software? Oh, my dear. Yes. Um, and first of all, I mean, if music is done or created with AI, you will not notice in the end, or you don't have to notice. You can notice it, obviously, like in some cases. But if someone has used, there's, there are not only music generating tools, there are also production tools. And if someone has mastered with AI or... For, for example, generated sounds with AI and then used it in, a, in another kind of songwriting or had a great idea for a lyric and then worked with Lyric Studio and completed it with AI, no one will notice in the end. So I think that is a very important point because this whole questions, uh, question about um, is mu uh, AI music colder or will it take away the artistic side of human beings? It's just the wrong question. But yeah. Okay. Do you think AI is more than software, more than bits and bytes, more than trained neural networks, computing just sigmoids and yeah, stuff course. like this? I mean, I think AI, um, if we look at the history of the term, like 1950s, John McCarthy coined this term like artificial intelligence. Based on the research of neural networks, etc. yes, it is more than bits and bobs and code because there's a lot of labor, there's a lot of power structures involved in building AI. What is AI? The current AI that we know now is not similar to the one that was before. There's paradigm shifts, there's like winter, so there's like economics capital, there's a lot of stuff around. So AI, yeah, for production, yeah, it's software. But the idea of artificial intelligence as a project, there is like many things involved that are bigger and you know more social, if you will, that have yes. to do with it. And it becomes more by interacting with it. And I think that is so important. Like, is a guitar just a guitar? It is, it, it is really about the interaction, and if you can use AI as a sparing partner or a muse or whatever, something that throws ideas at you, you still have to create it. You still have to have the taste, and um, that is actually, it's such a funny thing because on the other hand, you have these techies or AI companies that really look for how they can, or um, they want to make AI as creative as possible, and I want to make 
AI, no, I, I want AI to make us as creative as possible. And this is kind of uh, just a little shift, but it's a big difference. Yeah. I mean, this is the ongoing debate, like, uh, is, is AI a co-creation tool, which is what most AI researchers aim at to develop, or are we still in search for the, the ghost in the machine, which is more like what the media and the press and the sci-fi movies like to have. Um, but nevertheless, if, if we look at it as, as building block, consequences arise from the use. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your concerns when people use it with or without high expectations, low expectations, app use, misuse. What is the stuff which can happen? Okay, what stuff can happen? <laughs> I think we really need like a realistic point of view on AI. I mean, it's a super handy tool to make art, to make things, to create things, but it will not be like able to have a freedom or free will or to create on itself or by itself. Like AI will never just sit here on the on a chair with us and have these discussions we have. But it's like nevertheless, it's still really nice to have like this opportunity to work with it and you like have a conversation with it but it only um, works because of the humans and the human side on it so I think the concerns are yeah it's it's difficult to say because of course there are like always ethical concerns and consequence consequences but not in the art creating process itself it's like on a second Row, there are ethical concerns because, like, will artists in the still have jobs in the future if AI can create art itself? Or um, what, do you, what do we call art if AI, like, does it be better, faster, or smarter than the human? But in the art process itself, there is, like, no ethical concern on it, okay. in my opinion. <laughs> So, so you would agree that AI is already a game changer in this entire cultural process, process from creation through curation, uh, the yeah, the the labor work which has to be done, like mixing, mastering, etc. Um, it, it's already there to be a game changer, and people have to rethink their roles. Yeah, and it's always like. Um, these questions which arise with AI are like no AI genuinely questions, but they like really have uh, people to think about what is intelligence, what is art, and what is creativity. I think that is so important because I've seen so many panels where people come and go into these discussions about creativity and intelligence and la 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 and it's like no one has defined before what do you mean with by creativity i mean even if you look it up what do you mean with intelligence yeah. all all these things so i think the same goes for art like we have to speak about what how do we define art and for me there is a big difference of course can ai be creative it is already like it is a combination of all this like Datas that are there in new, uh, new ways, abstract and la la la. So uh, I will not define creativity here, but I can say that art is always a translation from impressions to uh, into another form through a personal filter. There has to be an urge to express something. And that is a big difference. You will have some more educated words for this, but for me it's like if a child throws up on the table, even if the pattern is nice. It's not art. But if I go there and put a golden frame around it and say, well, this, the dance was chaos and structure. It is art. And it's art in Europe. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, no, but you know what I mean. There's so yeah, much, sure. it, it is about, there is an intention. An yeah, intention and intention. I totally understand yeah. this, this yes, idea. And I, 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 no, but they, it's very important because by now AI can make amazing things yeah. and by but itself too. May I interrupt you yeah. because I would like to have this special stuff at the very end. And I'm 
have the question for both of you about this game changing thing. Yeah. Like if we look at it and it's in place and it's yeah. already a threat for some people or a big chance. Yeah. I'm just interested in when you meet people yeah. in your workshops, in your tutorials, yeah, yeah. when you make your artist profile coaching, real people in the creati creative process working with real AI tools, programming themselves, training, taking the Magenta plugins, whatever. How is their reaction which they come back with to you? Mixed results. I would say, especially, okay, we're talking about AI as a tool or as a medium. Mixed reality, uh, I can say in my workshops, people are either very enthusiastic, especially if they're coming from like sound art, because it opens up possibilities, aesthetic possibilities, more or less, uh, that were not there before, conceptual possibilities because of the nature of the medium. Um, but otherwise, if you are not, because it still requires some degree of programming to actually get into the field, if you're not this kind of, you don't have this kind of intelligence or you're not interested in this, then it becomes something very boring because of the current state, because it's very new in the state of like Python and code and trying to get stuff to work and then the blah, blah, blah. Um, so I've gotten these both reactions, right? One of, on, on one side, people are like super excited about the possibilities. They start engaging more. Uh, it becomes a community of people who are sharing their, their progress and this and that. Um, and on the other side, there's people who are not. This is just like hype, you know. But it's interesting to, to see once the people who are, because this, this also happened to me at the beginning when I started with AI generative systems. I was like, okay, at machine learning, ah, you can do interactive stuff. Yeah, whatever, you know, you can do interactive stuff with Arduino before. And then you start learning the, the field, what it to do, and it's like, ah, okay, then it, you can do actually this kind of stuff better, like uh, massive, on, massive amounts of ideas, and then start co-creating with it, you know, and, and these kind of possibilities were not there before. So once you really start getting deep into the field, then you see the opportunities, You're like, kind of like your brain starts yeah. working a different way. I, I would like to switch to you because I have the impression you are in close contact with artists who maybe have not the deepest expertise, like these programming guys doing all the Arduino boards and the Python code on TensorFlow and training a gum with meta DJ genres, uh, more like writing a good song. Yeah. bringing out a good expression, maybe experimenting with her very own voice and using AI tools. So wh what is the feedback of, of these people to you? Um, first of all, to, to explain that. So I'm giving workshop, uh, workshops for musicians how to use and how to play with AI tools. Um, and this comes from my this this time where I was sitting on panels talking to to techies, and I thought there are so many musicians who could profit from this, but they get bored. They fall asleep when they listen to this these words. No one understands. So I thought, well, if I work myself, I have this little nerdy brain. I work myself into it, and then I find a more tangible language. Um, so yet yeah, now back to your question. When I work with musicians on this, and I just did this on Wednesday, and it was online, so people could not even really try things out. But I play them things. I ask, uh, so what do you think? Is this AI or not? And then I show them different steps and give them sound um, examples, and they love it. They are really interested. And some people come with doubts. And because I kind of, I do it kind of fast forward and make it kind of nice, they want to know more afterwards and they actually start working with it. And this is, I love that. Yeah, so though there has been research about uh, song AI contests and what kind of tools people use for which part in songwriting, like losing a language model for the lyrics like GPT-2 or using uh, special algorithms only for the sound design of the voice or doing just little chord progressions and variations. Um, so. Do you know what, what people like most? Is it really like when we're looking at the actual avant-garde things from Holly Herndon playing with her voice or Mouse on Mars using also speech to be 
trained for generating then artificial uh, voice. Is it, can you say there is something which people like most? It's so different. It's like, ah, okay. uh, what kind of music do people like most? It's, you can't really say that. I can only speak from my experience, and I think it's uh, different from yours because you're in a different scene, but maybe there's some overlapping. So um, I created this Diana AI Song Contest, which invites musicians to create songs within a day in a writing camp. So three people get thrown together, write a song together in a day with five AI tools that are shortly explained to them beforehand. And it's done in the evening. They also create a video with AI, they master with AI. And the next day we have an award ceremony where we play the videos and prizes are blah, blah, blah. But what the nice thing is, is that there are, all those people are um, musicians or producers. None of them has worked with AI before and they don't know each other, so they have to collaborate. Like, the humans have to collaborate, and they have to dig into these things, find out the options. And because there is the time limit, they can't go into their ego or doubts. They just have to go because they're musicians, they want to finish something. And that is beautiful, and what I found out last year to make this bow is that all uh, nine people, all finalists, worked with the same AI tools, and the three songs that came out were totally different. So the winner's song is more this low, a little bit more heavy, then we had this pop burner, and then we had this more Florence and the Machine, and they actually used an AI voice from Pop Gun. I don't know if you use it. It's, uh, no, it, it's, it's sweet. Yeah, yeah. It's really sweet. <laughs> okay, you would say... Uh, these tools are accessible and uh, musicians like to play around with it and can come up with results. It's very uh, inspiring because it's inspiring. a new approach. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we leave a little bit the uh, granularity of writing one song and ask again uh, Moises about his very recent project, which is at the very top level, like building an AI-driven Meta DJ. We can actually play it. I think it would be nice for to have a little snippet um, so people can see. Yes. The, uh, may I? Yes. Yeah. If this, is the, if this is the one that's connected. This is the one that's connected. Okay. Can you find it? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, I don't know whether. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, I can I can send the link. Anyways, the, it would be really great if we could see it, because then it's, it becomes more clear what I'm talking about. It becomes a bit abstract. Can't we? Um, I I don't know what's the. Is it like on a? Oops. Sorry about that. Let's do. Can listen to that too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just make a new tab. <coughs> I mean, if Dorothea wants to like yes, have no, some input right. in yeah. between, <laughs> just don't want to leave it. Uh, yeah, I think I, I just wanted to say that we have to distinguish between, like, on the um, viewer's perspective, what like viewer or the art consumer calls art or sees art, and what is like on a theoretical point of view art, like from this art theoretical point. If you have a uh, word like uh, the whole concept of what art is, and I think on the viewer's point of view, it totally works. I mean, um, art pieces from AI they got sold for many millions and thousands, and uh, super uh, many people think it is art and like it, and can't really distinguish between a human artist and, uh, and an AI artist. But on the theoretical point of view, I think it's um, way more difficult. But isn't it interesting, even this art, I don't know if we speak about the same pieces, but they were not done by AI, but with AI. Yeah, as a tool. And it yes. an, an, was a an human idea. And also we, are also, we are also neural networks. Mm. We are filled with data and all this. So uh, anyway, but all these buzzword super sellers in the art world are created 
from humans, humans who are totally. filled with data. Yeah. So, and there we go. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I, I, I would say yes, we agree on this, but, but if we look now at this aggregation, yeah, so we enter a different zone, so where maybe Dorothea has some valuable input, <laughs> how we think about these things. So just a little preamble. So I, I do come from like the traditional pop music producer style. So I slightly shifted more into uh, sound art, which is more conceptual. So this, I consider it, it's a project called OIR. It's a play on words on to listen in Spanish, which Hua uh, Berlin is, uh, from what I understand, is to listen in German or listening, uh, which is a station, a community driven station here in Berlin. So this project consisted to do a meta DJ and basically to analyze all the patterns from like hours and hours of uh, DJ sets in this place. Uh, including myself, I played there before as well. So I just did um, a generative system where the sound and the image is synthesized directly from the latent space, unconditionally. Uh, there's a little bit of curation on my side at the end to create this kind of infinite DJ, more as, a, as an idea of a live archive, right? So we have an archive, big data. How do we make it alive generatively, right? So we can listen to a little bit of this. <laughs> Okay, impressive. So I think everybody gets <laughs> it. <laughs> so this is a full length DJ set. You can listen to it at home. It's a one hour long. <laughs> and both the, the music and the, and the mix itself is uh, made with machine learning. So it's this idea of like going back, what kinds of music does AI unlock? And it basically unlocks infinite music somehow. Of course, you have like, you have a vision, you have a curation. And this is like my role as an artist. Um, because this is not the first project that I do. So before this, I, I did an album that is 60 tracks long, uh, using also generative AI uh, system to um, to generate tribal music, which is a style of uh, music from, from Mexico. Uh, so again, going back to this archive idea, how do you make it alive? And also to play with these futurist ideas. Um, I think it just unlocks different kinds of way of thinking about art making or music making especially in this big data approach. So I would say it's, um, it's more of a medium. I yeah. would call it more of a medium in itself somehow. And, do you and have, a tool as well. Do you have feedback of the originators, of the Hör DJs being part of it? They were super into it. They were really into Great. it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this idea also, I mean, with the, with the past projects as well, like Okachiwali, which is like these tools, uh, could also be used you know, to reappropriate culture because they work with culture, uh, human labor. Um, and I was very careful to set precedents before that, right? To, to make it in an ethical way. So uh, ask permission with the archive, also posing a question, okay, this scene is happening mostly online, on YouTube, big data platform. What's gonna happen in 10 years when this becomes paid content? You know, like this kind of future, questions, right? Like, how do we keep representing scenes, music scenes, uh, in the long run? Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of potential in, in this uh, aggregation level, getting higher and higher in the <laughs> aggregation, which makes it at some point then difficult to say, um, should there be a, a, a artist plugin where the artist allows everyone to create endless pop tunes of his very specific style. So are you already considering such things like a kind of innovative, artist-friendly models for all these copyright issues, etc., that we do not end up in endless debates about sampling of Moses Pelham of Kraftwerk and it's not decided for 30 years? Yeah, I think these are really important legal questions and they really have to be solved sooner than later. 
but yeah, I think the politics is really slow at this point, and I think this is bad for the innovation, how you would probably tell um, for copyright and stuff like this. Um, yeah, but for the like the um, concept of art, I mean, it's totally art for sure, but the artist is a human being because only like a human being um, which has like freedom is able to do art. And like we said before, AI is a super, super tool and stuff like this could never happen without AI, but you would consider yourself the artist and not the AI program probably. Totally, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, this is a very clear point. Like um, yeah. I won't consider the systems that I built to be the author of, of this work. This is, a, this is my work as yeah. an artist. But, I mean, here, here again, we agree, but I guess you are working on other stuff too. Like, I mean, if you use machine learning, we all know about the things having bias, uh, enforcing prejudice, etc. Uh, maybe I'm not creative enough to transfer to the music scene, yeah? But um, yeah, I mean, there was like the consequences could be that there were like biased algorithms or AIs, but um, this is like it is not a genuine point about AI. It's about people. People are biased, like the artist or the consuming part of it, but not the program itself. Yeah. Okay. But but there have been asking for kind of regulation, like mm -hmm. uh, looking at the different dimensions of such an algorithm, trying to make the black box transparent, mm -hmm. trying to tell who is the programmer, who is the trainer, who is the original content. Uh, since you are deep in the academic uh, area, dealing with such things, you know, on, on the human side, side of it, uh, already people from politics asking for a little bit of advice on these things? On really specific questions, they do, like autonomous driving or stuff like this, or in the uh, medicine sector, but there was like no general yes or no answer, like always, <laughs> if you ask. And, and they did, did they manage to make the transfer already to the creative stuff? Because you mentioned uh, healthcare and mm -hmm. driving, these are, I mean, yeah, since years, the, uh, the stuff uh, industry is interested yeah. in. And um, just from my experience, research on AI in creative industry was not so much pushed in, yeah. in the last decades. That's why I'm asking if uh, this, there might be still a kind of lag yeah, until it, these questions it's arise. It's here because like, I think the copyright question is the only question which um, would be in the politics right now, if I'm right. Oh, well, there are questions about what Spotify does with this um, algorithm. And there comes, actually, that's the only case where I could think of bias in terms of um, music, because it is taste leading and in a very, very good way, which is the scary thing about it. <clears throat> One maybe fan, uh, fun fact about this thing, there is an AI, AIVA, that is um, registered as a... What is this? Sakem? Um, yeah, Sakem. So yeah. It, it has its own um, thing. What is that? Collection? Um, it, like it, GEMA. What, what it, is that? Yeah, yeah. It's the French GEMA. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the, the startup of Ava managed that. Uh, <laughs> Collection the AI, Society. Yeah. Can so it, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, yeah. Aiva is its uh, artist in its, its own right. It's like autonomous somehow. Yes. Oh, okay. And that's why, and, and the, <laughs> the funny thing is, it's just a very well-trained AI, and, but it never listened to music. It only got, like, it read 30, 000, more than 30,000 scores of old masters, like Beethoven, Mozart, la, 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 and broke it down, just complete just math. Mm -hmm. Broke it all down, analyzed, like, how the sequences work, patterns, what it means in, in terms of um, atmosphere or whatever. So uh, they train it very well. Mm -hmm. And now whenever it's uh, generating something, it's truly original and what they did was the beautiful a beautiful project they trained um so eva is pre-trained but then they fed it only with all the opuses of dwarjak i don't know if you know dwarjak he's a great classical music musician and he he had an opus a movement he couldn't finish because he died so eva got fed only with all the other opuses 
or movements, and um, they finished this movement together with the Eva, and it was premiered in 2019 by the Praga Philharmonics, and it's beautiful. You can look it up. There's also a piano version of it, which is also very beautiful. This is a really good uh, point that you made. So this idea that you train algorithms on human culture and then they're really good at this human culture. Um, when I first got into machine learning, it was very difficult for me to kind of engage because I come not from Europe, <laughs> basically. So, I mean, I, I do have a background in listening to classical music and this and that, but other basically this is like a minority of music around the world and there's many other musics way more musics around the world that are not being represented in artificial intelligence. And this is, I think, one of the key issues, at least in AI and music, that the models that are getting built uh, are optimized for very specific kinds of music. So this, we could say, is the bias in AI and music that is not necessarily a uh, racial bias or the discrimination, but somehow it is. Great point. And I never thought about it like this. So that's yeah. no, it's, it's obvious. Now that you say it, it's so obvious. Yes. Of course, and it's yeah. like, if you train an AI, you basically tell it how to think, not what to think, but how to think. Exactly. And whatever you feed it into it afterwards, it will still think it's brought up, it's trained by this culture. Exactly. Yes. So, and that, so, so there we have the bridge. Yeah. Th this is exactly the point. So for me, like the projects that I do try to pose the question of like, training a AI on tribal music from Mexico, this very specific sound that no AI researcher in the global north would be like, oh, let's try this cumbia or whatever, no? Uh, Latin American sounds, uh, because it's just not in the research, because the research is being done in Europe, etc. right? And this is not like, it's not a fault of it, because it's just inherent in the history of it, but it's something that needs to somehow be addressed at this point, because otherwise we're gonna get stuck in a loop, like cultural, wise, right? We're going to get stuck in the, because AI is just reproducing the past and new permutations. So if it's only going to be trained on Eurocentric culture, then it's only going to be that forever. And this is a big point. And, and this is like a not, it wouldn't last much, I think. No, but I, I would say in because humans are working with these AIs and feed it new data and AI means it is learning, so there will be change, but we still have the ground pro problem you were talking uh, exactly, talking about, yeah. so that will be there. And I think it's, it's a great thing to, to actually, that to raise that in uh, on more platforms and to say, hey, how about pushing this further? It, yeah, I was just in a panel yesterday with uh, called uh, Traditions in Transition, uh, organized by one of the uh, engineers, ex-engineer at Google Magenta, Hanoi. He helped uh, build the DDSP algorithm there, and he's organizing this idea of transcultural yeah. uh, technologies, right? So, so, so you would say AI is kind of uh, an abler kind of a uh, self-reflection mirror helping us. It's like us. a bias machine. It's like an autonomous bias machine. You put your own data and culture in there, you get it reflected in new ways. And then you can play around with it, right? So yeah, but like I, not for me, the this program is a, itself is like bias, it's the people. Exactly. Or the Eurocentric view in this. Exactly. I mean, even in example. the mathematics, if you read um, Weapons of Math Destruction, this book, it's like this idea of, of the Boolean gate you know, the, this idea of keeping something away. You know, these are very core mathematical principles that are built into the systems. Generative adversarial network, this idea of adversariality as a proof of intelligence competition. Why is it not like a generative cooperative network? Why are we not building these kind of metaphors into the algorithms themselves? So th these are the kind of questions that I think uh, would help kind of the field go a bit more further because then we are just stuck in the same th conversations, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Great point. <clears throat> One thing to uh, kind of crack down these cliches is that I encourage people to use the tools in a way that they are not supposed to do to use yeah. them. For example, Boomi, you can choose from a million styles and half of it is awful, of course, but you've, uh, I say, well, go to customized, uh, try, for example, 
choose trap, but then only give it strings and mess with the tie it with a uh, tempo, yeah. and then see like what can you take the drums out, and then download the stems, and see where it gets you. So um, and this can be very inspiring, but it's it's truly an effort to take something and to say what else can I do with you? How can I how can I fuck with you to like inspire me in a way that it's not so cliche. Yeah, yeah. M maybe it's too early and we need to wait a little bit until the very creative artist comes around the corner to, to make a twist and a hack like people did with sampling and the TR-808 yeah. and then we will see really surprising stuff. Why? I mean, he's already working on stuff <laughs> and uh, I just said that we are doing this uh, all right, uh, already now, like just, you know, hacking things by just using them in a way you can't... You, you're not supposed to use them, and that's always a good idea. Yeah, but I would I say we are... We are I, I'm really ab about that kind of... So, like so you would not agree that we are still somehow in, in early days in comparison to other inventions in music technology? Yeah, for sure. They're very early, so anything goes, kind of. <laughs> like, we're at the Wild West of, like, making these kinds of projects or just, Wild like, uh, West. Interesting, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm, from, I'm from California. Baja California is, like, the West. <laughs> like, the West West. Okay, I would like to uh, open up, uh, since we have some couple of minutes for some questions of the audience. Since we have here wonderful agreement, maybe the audience has some questions nasty ones concerns yes do we have a mic in the audience no yeah <laughs> um we work with the free version of aiva we work with popgun a uh, splash pro we work with Boomi, but I have these uh, pro accounts where you cost, cost, uh, where you not only can customize, but also get uh, suck out the MIDI and the stems. Uh, we work with Lyric Studio, which is the only lyric generating, and I'm coming from like writing, the, the first and only lyric generator that is so inspiring. Um, have a look at it before I get into promoting it. Um, and uh, then we master because it has to be fast with Lander. Lander, it's, you know, that's just, they have a new feature where you can upload a reference song, which makes it a little bit nicer. But that's, you know, just to conclude that, uh, did I forget something? Um, yes, we do the videos with uh, Rotor and their own footage. Like I show them how to upload their own stuff, which they film in the day into, um, Rotor, and what? I, maybe I forgot one, but this is about this is about it. So it's all really, you know, easy to grasp, but you can go with it quite far. Like if you use Popgun in a weird way, you can get quite far. These voice voices are great. I guess the website is still up, and there are the details on it. Yes. 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 Okay. So another one. Yes. Moises? Uh, you, you can just check it out here. It's, al it's already like many hours of music. Okay. If it's all good, yes or no. But um, I think the question is going to be that the aesthetics that develop from working with artificial intelligence are going to start seeping into the mainstream, which some artists already are developing. Um, and then these aesthetics are going to become either very polarized. Some people are going to be, ah, no, this is really bad. Some people are going to be more engaged. Some people are going to like it. You know, there's going to be this, like, as always. Will it be like auto-tune? <laughs> I, I hope so, because uh, because a lot, there was, a, you know, this sounds, you know, like you right now you have this generative and a neural network sound that is very raspy, sounds very rough. And this is a kind of acquired taste. I mean, I come from experimental noise music. <laughs> I already have that ear, but I don't expect everybody to have this ear, you know, and... and 
And but I think these kind of uh, aesthetics are like some really good pop artists are going to start using them, and then it's going to become the hot new thing. You know, it's always these trends. Um, so I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. But there's always going to be either a team of artists or collective working behind it, more or less. Uh, I I don't see it becoming like the decentralized, I mean, some artists are trying to do this decentralized autonomous artist thing, which, okay, this is another question altogether. Yeah. It is, it's so funny with this topic anyway, you open the door and there are so many doors behind it. If you don't want to just, you know, talk and punch lines, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, to answer, it's so funny because that is, seems to be kind of a fear, like will AI take over the human musician? And I can say absolutely clearly, no. It, this, you can only think that way if you only think about the product, the outcome. But making music is about making music. And humans have done this as long as humans are on Earth. Like from singing to drumming on a, on a hill. And people love also to connect to uh, this emotional storytelling that humans do. If humans have the chance to make a living out of that in the future, that's another question. But people, you know, musicians don't make music because they can. They do it because they have to. That's why they are so cheap. And you can treat them really badly. They will still do music. Um, so don't worry, there will always be human music, but... Um, oh, will AI kill jobs, change our creativity, change the music industry? Yes. That's, yeah. Yeah, wonderful final statement, Jovanka. We can stop now. <laughs> no, I have one last. This one is for me. So, oh, one question, the last one. I can, um, <clears throat> we can exchange numbers and I sent you a PDF with really like easy tools and you have to find out like what, what suits you, what's fun for you. But the, the, the ones I, uh, I named already are really easy to dive in and you see if it if it's re 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 resonates with you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So one last, so normally we talk about the future, but I would like to boil it down to a one-year perspective. So each of you thinking about the project he's working on, if everything works really fine the next year, not like the last two ones, where would you like your project, your thesis to be in one year regarding this topic of AI? Well, I work theoretical on the part, so I can't really answer this question like you do probably, but I think my approach is, it, it got clear, there will always have to be a human being who is free, who is creative, and who will make the art. And you publish it in a top exactly. journal, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jovanka, you in one year with your projects? I think start. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm also currently developing a tool to make it easy for musicians who don't want to program and go crazy with the learning all this stuff um, to be released. It's a tool called Semilla, which means seed in Spanish. And it's basically um, a very simple uh, generative neural network that basically the opposite of a sampler, instead of you sampling, it generates samples for you. Nice. And then you, you play around with the seeds, which is the latent space, okay, I'm not gonna go super deep, but yeah, basically it's a sample generator based on your own data, and then there's interesting ways how you can manipulate this data. And hopefully it's gonna be out as a web application next year. Great. I want that. Great. There's already a <laughs> we can use it in the next Diana next year. I would love to, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sure. great. <laughs> um, so, um, we will do another Diana. We did our first Diana AI Song Contest last autumn. This year in October, we do our second one uh, in collaboration with the Zona Festival in Barcelona and the Fraunhofer Institut. And um, who else? Uh, whatever. So we're very much looking forward to that. And actually, the application is 
It ended yesterday, but I decided if you want to apply and you do it hashtag popkultur, you can put in your application until next Tuesday. Yes, and next year we will go to Montreal, to Mutec, and to Moscow, nice. and hello. Great. So, good luck for this. And you, you have your take-home message. The contest is still open. And I hope you get new insights out of our discussions and you have no fear of AI and still love to do music and write great AI tools and enjoy the rest of the evening here at the pop culture event and I'm say thank you to my wonderful panelists I learned a lot and it was yeah it was a nice evening bye thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you.